um, just to get us started, remember some Zoom etiquette. If you haven't already, please mute your line. We will have an opportunity at the end of Dr. Santon's presentation uh, to, for questions and answers. And of course, we'll be monitoring the chat along the way. So please let us know um, if you have any questions about that. Those are usually in a, a menu at the bottom of the screen. The, um, we'll have about 30, 45 minutes of presentation with the questions and answers at the end. Um, closed captioning is provided. So um, please be sure to click that option also at the bottom of your screen. And I think that's it. Um, in general, let me welcome all of you to our Grand Rounds, uh, Ability Grand Rounds. This is um, our first of 2021 and we're very excited. Um, and I'm honored to um, get to introduce Dr. Sarah Santon. Um, she's our first presenter of the year. She's talking about the effects of biobehavioral environmental approach on disability among low income elder adults. Dr. Santon is um, a professor an endowed professor specifically for health equity and social justice, um, and the director of the Center for Innovative Care in Aging. Um, let's see. So with that, let me turn it over to Dr. Santon. Thank you, Dr. Santon, for presenting to us today. Oh, it's my pleasure. And nice to see those of you who have your camera on and the pictures of those of you who, who don't. And um, just for my benefit, if people would just quickly put in the chat if you are um, a faculty member or a student or both or a community member or just just so I can see almost like a show of hands of um, of who's here with us because I'd like to be as inclusive as possible when I'm talking. So I see staff, um, staff, staff, great, okay. Trainee, student, staff, faculty, staff, great, okay. Thank you. There's a, we got a lot of good staff members. <laughs> um, social worker and long-term care. Thank you, staff, community member. Great. Okay. And IDD waivers. Excellent. Thank you so much. Um, so I um, am a really informal person. If you have questions throughout, please feel free to raise your hand. I'll also, um, you know, I come from a particular perspective. I'm a nurse practitioner and I have a PhD and um, but of course, before that, I'm, I'm a human. And so, you know, if I use any jargon or any um, something that's not clear, feel, I'll keep an eye on the chat too. So if, um, or you could raise your hands or, um, you know, or just say that doesn't make sense to me. Or, um, so um, again, thank you for the invitation. And I'm going to um, share my screen. Make it bigger. Yeah, can, can you all see that? Great, okay. So um, I'm gonna be talking about a program called Capable that is um, designed based on uh, my experience doing house calls with older adults. And then we're gonna talk about how we've grown it um, and lessons that we've learned. And again, um, you know, I'm happy to have this be more of a dialogue. Um, oh, and I'm realizing I can't really pay attention to the chat at the same time. Okay, oh, thanks for listening, okay. So um, I am I'm a nurse practitioner and I used to provide house calls in the community. And at that time I would present them, I would, I would do a visit just the same way I would do in a clinic. And so I was pretty traditionally trained. And so those visits tended to be about their blood pressure or their diabetes or their congestive heart failure or you know whatever they would have come in for a clinic visit for. And although I could see their whole home environment and how they got around or didn't, that wasn't the the major part of the visit. The visit was like this medical visit, but in their home. And it became more and more incongruous for me. Like, so for example, Mrs. B, she, and she gave us permission to share her story. Um, she had arthritis that was bad enough that it was difficult to get dressed. Um, she had congestive heart failure and diabetes and high blood pressure. And she pretty much sat in that chair all day. And um, she, and she was difficult for her to get dressed because of the arthritis. She did. She put on that hat because she was excited about the picture being taken. But um, now, part of the reason that she um, couldn't get dressed is: look, this is where her clothes were. 
Her clothes were in basically a sweater bag that was torn and had safety pins. And she had real arthritis in her fingers. And um, this was her floor after we fixed it. She had holes all throughout it. And um, these were her outside stairs on the back. So, you know, so she just going backwards, um, whoops. She sat in this chair, but it was partly in some ways that's a safer thing to do, right? And so she had a, a TV in front of her. The bed is in, is in what used to be her dining room. And what you see that looks like a window is, is her front door. Um, and she actually had a two foot by one foot hole right by the front door. And like, I would have to kind of leap over that hole to get in and out. And so um, when we put so much money into people's, you know, medications and surgeries and stuff and so little into their daily lives. Um, and so this was a really aha period for me and began to think with others, how can we address people's overall life experience rather than just thinking about their blood pressure control, for example. And um, so um, we, together with, with colleagues, especially Dr. Laura Gitlin, who had developed the ABLE program that Capable is adapted from, we um, decided to have nursing visits, occupational therapy visits, and handy worker, um, handy man, handy worker, uh, attention to their environment. So we modify the environment and work with the whole person to, to try to get the best fit between those. Um, and now I'm just going to back you up into a little data of kind of like why, besides like me saying, oh, this seems important in terms of why society would care. So functional limitations are very costly. And um, of course, we don't want anyone to suffer or not be able to have a full life. But in terms of thinking through a problem that payers or the government might want to grow, this is old data, you can see. But you can see the point of this data is you see how the orange bars get taller as they go to the right. And that's showing you that just having a chronic condition doesn't make you very likely to be um, hospitalized a lot or other reasons you, that economists would call you a healthcare spender. It's once you've got some functional limitations and difficulties with ADLs and IADLs, you know, activities of daily living, that, um, that people become so-called more expensive. And that's, um, you know, the way economists talk about people. And of course, really the real reason to work with people who have difficulty getting around and taking care of themselves is to improve their lives. But it helps in terms of growing the program that payers who might not even be thinking about people as individuals um, would, be, would be saving money if everyone could be the most able possible. And so for this reason, um, Older adults with functional limitations actually drive um, population health outcomes because there's so much more um, expense for people who have difficulty with things like dressing, bathing. And so in Capable, the older adult, or the, you know, we would love to do it with younger people with disabilities also, but we haven't so far. The older adult is the expert. Clinicians support those older adults' goals rather than the clinician saying, this is what you need to do. And we've shown that it's increased physical function, reduced depression, there's fewer hospitalizations and nursing home admissions. And so this is kind of a summary of the whole talk and I'll go through it and also what we've learned. But if you fall asleep right now, you sign up right now or your dog needs to be let in outside, like this is the, <laughs> this is the gist. Um, and so um, capable, it's four months long. As I mentioned, it's a handy worker, a nurse and occupational therapist. Um, it's six visits with an OT, four visits with a nurse, and up to $1,300 in a handy worker budget. And I will talk about how that works. It, the, real, the main focus is activities of daily living and instrumental activities of daily living. So, you know, like bathing, dressing, grooming, um, and, and the ideals, things like managing medications, getting groceries into the house, light housekeeping. Um, we also really assess for what matters to people not just within those, but you know, if getting out to the backyard to garden or other things that matter to them. And the total cost is a little less than $3,000 per person over those four months. And you'll see that we, um, it ends up saving more than 10 times that much. So it's, it's a, and we've been able to measure that. Um, so capable, again, match, lasts over four months. And this, these green hands represent the occupational therapist. And 
she or he starts the program with the older adult and really gets a sense of with each one of those activities of daily living and instrumental ones, um, what the person has difficulty with, what they don't, and what crucially what matters to them. So someone may say, I don't really know what my medications are for, um, but they're in this box. And my daughter fills it up once a week and I take them the way I'm supposed to. But I want to focus on bathing right now. Oh, my grandson has to come over and pick me up out of the bath for me to get in and out of the bath. And that's embarrassing to him and to me. And so that's what I'd like to focus on. So if that's the case, that's what we focus on. And the people can make three goals with um, their OT and three goals with the nurse. And uh, on the second visit with the OT, they uh, go around the home or the apartment looking at the places where those goals take place. So for example, in bathing, um, they, would look, they would go into the bathroom together and the older adult would show the OT how they usually would you know, grab onto the, the soap dish or the towel rack or whatever they've adapted to do that maybe could be optimized. Um, and then together they make a work order for the handy worker that are prioritized based on what the person wants um, and what matters to them. So for example, if they're choosing uh, maybe like getting outside their front door and down to get in their daughter's car might be one and maybe getting outside in the back to garden and being able to bathe. Then the things in the work order would be specifically things that help with those like a second um, banister down the stairs or, um, grab bars around the bathtub and a shower chair. Or, but, but so the point of this is that we then don't say, well, you need to tape down your rugs because those are slippery unless the person has really prioritized that. Um, the nurse starts um, a month in and works on strength, balance, pain, depression, primary care provider communication, and all the things about medication. Are they on too many or too few? Or do they know what they are? Do, um, are they on you know, three blood thinners? And, the nurse assesses for all those domains, but unless the person says they matter to them, then they don't, they're not prioritized. Um, and then you can see the visits kind of happen one after another and the OT and the nurse um, collaborate. And, um, you know, we do really simple things like this home, two 80 year olds lived in, and there was not even a single banister on the bottom of those stairs, on the last four steps of those stairs. And so we'll just put in simple, we don't paint them. Um, but the idea is um, that if you have two banisters, you can distribute your weight and come down um, more safely. So Capable has grown. It's now in 33 places in 17 states, including we've just added Alaska. Um, and these are some of our partners. And I will um, next show you about some of the data and then tell you some stories about it so that you can see, get it more of a sense of how it works. Um, so this is data from, this is in the Health Affairs Journal, showing that 75% um, of the people improved in terms of their ADL limitations and 65% in terms of their IADLs um, from beginning to end. And this depression, more than half improved, and that even counts people who weren't depressed at all to begin with. So that's kind of a conservative one. And then of course the home hazards improved. Um, and this was from a randomized control trial showing um, the change in ADLs and IADLs, um, the difficulty. So the, the, it was a, you know, a more, almost 40% reduction in, um, in the ADLs and the, uh, the IADLs were 30%. And then this is a paper published also in Health Affairs by Sarah Ruiz et al, who worked for CMS at the time. And it showed that if you see the blue circles that um, this is that Medicare costs for, for the capable participants was negative. So that means it was lower um, at $2,700 per quarter per patient. And they filed them for eight quarters. So that adds up to more than $20,000 per person. Um, and um, that was, you know, very convincing to the government. Um, and then this is in Medicaid. Um, and I know it's hard to see the... Um, abbreviations, but basically what you see from these is that the orange is a lot smaller in the tr people who got capable than the people who didn't. And um, the orange is the inpatients, the hospital. And this blue difference is nursing home admission. And that actual, that difference between these 
was enough to pay for capable for the whole of the cohort. Um, and so the, the difference in hospitalization was extra and that's why it saves so much money. So it saves a lot of hospitalization. Then of course people really like it. They like being able to get out to garden or being able to get out their front door or being able to take a bath. And so you can see, so the, um, the green is the people who got capable and you can see the overall benefit was almost 100% of people. It made their life easier, made their home safer, kept them living at home, gained confidence with daily challenges, helped them care for themselves. A fewer, but still like almost 50% of people said it helped them care for others, um, helped them feel less distressed and, and they thought would help others. And in general, they didn't think it was too much work. And this control group, they also thought it was good. Um, what they did for the control was they had um, the same number of visits, but it was people who were providing attention based on their goals, based on sedentary goals. So they were learning how to use the internet, um, planning family reunions, learning how to use a smartphone, a lot of really good stuff that helped reduce social isolation. Um, so we were glad to be able to provide that for them. But you can see that the difference, you know, the bigger differences are things like and made their life easier, their home safer. And so that makes sense. Um, so I'll tell you just a few stories of a few participants to help, you know, kind of get this um, grounded in your, in your knowledge. And then um, we can have some more discussion. So Mrs. D, she was one of the first people in the second studies. And the first time we went to see her, um, she was sitting in a commode chair, like a toilet chair, right next to her bed. And that's where she sat all day long. And she was just kind of nodding off when the, um, when the OT first went. And um, her whole bedroom was just a, a bed she shared with her husband and a commode chair. And that's all there was room for. And so she was actually really socially isolated from her family because she couldn't get downstairs. She hadn't been downstairs in two years. And um, she, her, you know, family members would come up and say hi, but who would wants to sit with someone who's on a commode chair and all there is to sit as a, as a bed. So she was really pretty isolated. And, and again, she hadn't been downstairs in two years. And um, what we realized, the nurse realized on the first visit was she, she was, her family was giving her 26 different medications um, that she had gotten from different hospitalizations and no one had ever really straightened them out. And a number of them were for pain and her, her family was giving to the, her to them all at once. So she was really over medicated. And once she was on um, a more appropriate number, I mean, we just worked with her. Some of them were just the exact same medications over and over. Um, she was much more alert and she was thrilled. And um, so she came up with that goal of being able to go downstairs and wash her hair in the kitchen sink. That was her goal. And that's how specific they are. They're not just like feel better or something. And um, I think it's a really good example of a, of a person-centered goal because probably none of us on this call, if we went in to see her would have said, you know what, you should wash your hair in the kitchen sink and that'll be really motivating, right? But that's where asking a person about what matters to them matters. And so she was really motivated to get strong, to be able to go do that. And so. With, with our budget for the handy workers, she said, well, how about if we spend some of it on plastic chairs, like the kind you might put on a deck um, all along the hallway towards the stairs so that she could, um, she would just like sit down in one and then stand up and move and sit in the next one and then rest and rest. And so there's a month in between our visits and she did that every day, practicing between the chairs without trying to go down the stairs. And um, we added a second banister to the stairs and lit them. And by partway through the intervention, she could go downstairs on her own. And as, again, she hadn't done that in two years. Um, another thing. For downstairs in her house for two years before we came. So that was a huge success for us. Um, so the, Mrs. D, um, you know, represents a like a really big change. So a more average kind of capable change is someone like Mrs. H who had asthma and diabetes and high blood pressure and arthritis. And she had a hard time taking care of herself more, some weakness and some that she was breathless because of her asthma and she couldn't walk up steps or outside the house. 
Um, and she was in pain from the arthritis, but she didn't take anything for it because um, she thought she was supposed to take a leave, which was hurting her stomach. So she took nothing. So we did a lot of really simple things for her. Like one was um, connecting her with a primary care provider to be on a better kind of inhaler um, that weren't emergency ones, but were long acting preventive ones. And we suggested that she try Tylenol, which didn't hurt her stomach. And we have exercises that are based on um, Otago, which is a New Zealand um, strength and balance um, program. And so she did those and um, we made it easier for her to take a bath by putting, um, you know, grab bars in, around. And also she was becoming stronger and for her getting down into the water was like her favorite thing for pain. Um, and we also, she was, um, very hard of hearing. Um, you could hear her TV on, outside her house before you walked in. Um, and um, her, we got her this thing called a super ear, which some of you may know about, but it's basically the size of like an iPhone and it comes with um, earbuds or um, a headset. And you just point it at whatever you're wanting to hear better. And so it's like a personal amplifier. And that transformed her. She could sit in church and hear what was happening. And she could listen to the TV lower and engage more in conversation. And, you know, the more we know about the brain and dementia and hearing, there's a big correlation there between, you know, um, hearing and um and cognitive well-being. Um, we also did some things in her house, like some railings, and her she had a, her linoleum floor was torn throughout her kitchen, and so that was a trip hazard. But so these are really small things. Um, but she um, she looked right at me and she said, "If I had ten thousand tongues and they could all speak at the same time, I couldn't praise the capable pro program enough." And for her, you know, she was in less pain. She could hear. She could get around her house, she could take a bath, and that was all like really transformative to her. And it, it was little things, really small things that built up to make a difference. Um, so in, so the, the ways it kind of works is that um, working with the person and their environment with what matters to them. And um, so that unleashes their motivation and also makes them more able to take on new challenges. So, you know, I'll give you an example. We never say, oh, you should quit smoking. You know, by the time someone's an older adult, they've heard that a lot of times from a lot of people. But we have had some people who meet their goals that they've set with us. And then at the end, they say, you know what, I'm going to quit smoking now, you know, because becoming, um, having more self-efficacy can lead to others. Um, we honor their strengths and goals and work with, build on their strengths. There's no nagging. There's no, you should have done this. Why didn't you do that? And, um, and we provide resources, right? So it's not just, oh, you should take a bath. It'd be good if you took a bath. It's providing the grab bars and the stools and the and a microwave or a crock pot or whatever it is that goes along with their goals. And so, um, you know, if you have difficulty getting around, it can be a lot nicer. And, and if you don't have that much money, it can be a lot nicer to have the actual the, the tools provided for you um, than to say, oh, you know, this thing should happen. Um, and as I mentioned, we help build self-efficacy for new challenges. Um, so function, you know, as I mentioned before, poor function is costly to the healthcare system. And it's what we all care about more than our blood pressure or our hemoglobin A1C for diabetes. You know, being able to be a grandparent or to volunteer somewhere or to um, you know have a job or whatever it is. It's function. The reason we care about health is so that people can function. But unfortunately, in regular healthcare, we don't pay too much attention to function. And um, we've shown it can really be modified. Um, so the opportunity here is um, is vast and as we innovate in healthcare, you know we used to think a lot more about hospital-based health care and then went on to kind of clinic and outpatient and now the, the world is really turning to home-based care and how to um, improve living at home and not just be thinking about you know the clinic visits um, and that's true you know hospital care is coming home and home care and all kinds of programs which makes more sense because that's where we live right I mean literally and that's where time is spent so it makes much more sense to be thinking through um, what is happening there than in other healthcare sitting settings um, I can go into the payers for capable if anyone has questions about that and um, 
I'll just tell you that there's a lot of places that have been doing capable and um, President-elect Biden actually mentioned capable for a whole minute in a speech this summer where he talked about he just the whole thing talked about, you know, if you need a banister and this and that. And so that was exciting. Um, and uh, it's on their website and everything. Um, so, you know, in closing, I just kind of want to get more towards your ideas and your thoughts and what you are doing already. And I wanted to say my perspective of growing something that can change how people experience care or their life is that um, at first, you know, this little seed is your research idea and you test it out at first. And then, um, and then as it gets a little bigger, it can um, have, you might like pitch it to NIH or some other place that provides research funding to see if it, if it has an effect on what you're trying to affect. And then the next phase, um, often a foundation will help out. We've been really lucky with foundation support where they're interested in new ideas and they're interested in seeing what happens in the real world, not so much like in a test tube or perfect conditions. Um, and then the only way you're gonna get it to be a tree, <laughs> you know, is if, um, it can be sustained where people aren't constantly writing grants. So if it's either a market solution where a company picks it up or if government, um, you know, it becomes a Medicare or a part of Medicaid or another way. And so that's what we're working on, on now. And right now um, there's a lot of philanthropy and we're working on government fundings. And um, so I kind of wanted to wrap up by saying that like, you know, you all, just from what I could see in the chat, have a lot of different interesting perspectives and experiences, and you see what matters. And I would really encourage you to, you know, work with partners to develop ideas for, um, for change. And for that, I'll just say that um, I found it important to build from your insight and from just what you experience. Um, and that once you build some momentum, people want to be a part of it that stories are important. And, you know, we tend to think of data, 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 and of course data is important, but it's not sufficient. And it's not enough that we're really um, wired for story much more than we are. Like, and if you think back to this talk, what's gonna stick with you probably is the people I described, not with the data so much. The data is important, um, but stories really um, carry the day. And then we've let capable sites try different things and work in different ways. Some of them are Meals on Wheels sites, some of them are Habitat for Humanity, some of them are primary care offices, you know, where they go out into the home. And um, it's good to learn from a lot of different ways of, of doing this. Um, I don't think that behavioral interventions should have to pay for themselves because, you know, you never, if you, someone invents you know, a hepatitis C pill that costs a thousand dollars, no one says, well, that has to pay for itself. It's just, it's good and it's medicine and it helps. Um, but it does help that Capable saves more money than it costs. Um, but also as you think through your ideas, other markers of value can be important like employee satisfaction or, um, you know, the insured beneficiary satisfaction or turnover rates, or there's other ways of showing your value as well. And then I would just say, this is more for you personally, that I always think that um, managing your energy is more important than managing your time. And we have really finite amounts of time in the day, but our energy, as, as you know, from different things you do during the day, some things feel like an energy, you know, sink or, or suck, and some things like give you energy and to pay attention to those things and that those are the things that um, can help you want to, um, go further. So I will stop sharing so I can see you all, And but I'm happy to bring up the slides if people have questions. Great, thank you very much. Sure. So at this point, um, let's open it up for questions and then you can either use the chat or feel free to unmute yourself and ask away. I don't necessarily have a question other than that I'm going to go look more closely at the map uh, of okay. already rolled out sites. And I just, I think this is fantastic. Um, the holistic approach of just taking a moment to hear an individual. I mean, the change from Aleve to Tylenol, that costs zero dollars. Right. Uh, so it's, it's just so important that these conversations are happening on a, on that level rather than the quick in and out um, kind of clinical setting. So it just... 
big fan of what you're doing. Thank you. And you know, the, the, the primary thing people say to us when they, is they say, you are the only people in my healthcare experience who don't tell me what to do, who don't come in with an agenda on their way. You just ask what I want to do. And so that's a luxury, right? We're not their primary care. We're not their mother. We're not anybody who's in charge of them. It, where it's more like we're in a consultant role, but it's amazing how much you can do by listening to people and then um, using your clinical expertise to ask them better questions and to listen better and to combine it with their ideas. The breath of fresh air. <laughs> thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. So um, think about your programs and, and how, you know, to what extent um, you incorporate some of this, if you do at all. And if you haven't uh, incorporated some of this collective view, uh, maybe a question is, how did you all get started? I mean, you had the research question, but what are the first four steps um, that you did to really start getting this philosophy across your team yeah. to build the partners, those kinds of things? Thank you. So um, I actually, um, when I first wrote the grant to do this and didn't get it, because you never get the first grant <laughs> the first time, um, I thought, well, how, how can I do this without, you know, without for having this grant? And I had um, some foundation money for a different project, and I talked that foundation into letting me do this instead. <laughs> um, so, um, and we weren't as rat as much person centered at the beginning as we were. We would we learned, and I think that is part of what's a really important lesson. And thanks for asking the question. Is to to when you, to really be hearing feedback and and to 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 listen to what's not going well too. So so in the very beginning of the first pilot, we when what remember when. I, said the work order is prioritized in terms of what the person wants. Mm -hmm. At first, we put safety first and then what they wanted. And so we would say, well, this rug really needs to be tacked down or you really need this. Um, and we could hear from people this like, how dare you tell me about my house and my life? And so we changed and we just made it, if there's something that seems pretty dangerous, we, we might mention it. We might say, I, I wasn't sure what you thought about addressing this it's up to you you know and um the thing is is that people live in their house if something bugs them about something you have done they're seeing it all the time like just think about if your own kids pick up their clothes or their dirty towel or something every time you see it you're like huh <laughs> why didn't they why did they leave the dishes in the sink and so if you're an outsider and you're coming into someone's home and you're doing something that's not exactly what they wanted it's really magnified because we all love our kids or our husbands or whoever um, but you don't necessarily love like an outsider so um, in terms of developing that philosophy it really got stronger and stronger and stronger and now we're very clear about it anytime we do anything it's really the old the person that we're working with they're the ones in charge and what we have is resources and abilities to um, to to help make the what they want to come true. And then you asked in terms of partners, and I think um, so. I've lived in Baltimore a long time, and I think um, had a sense of so we work with a nonprofit called um, Civic Works. It's an, it's an AmeriCorps training site, and they um, so when they do the handy worker part, they're actually two people. There's a senior person and a um, apprentice going in and so that's really nice because the the younger person is kind of getting some modeling of what being an older adult looks like and so th they sometimes are shocked at how older adults sometimes have to live but also they get advice from the older adults like the older adults will say you know you should really fix your teeth it'll help you get a job or you know you should call me ma'am or you know whatever it is but um that's been a really nice partnership as well that's great Yeah. Are you seeing any commonalities within regions, um, considering you're across at least half the United States, between what people are asking for or what it is that it seems that they need when they've been assessed? That's a great question. I don't think we've formally done that in a research way, but um, what we do have a paper looking at the what people generally want on their um, in terms of their home modifications. And, you know, I'm just gonna take a note on what you said about the, um, looking at that. Um, we tend to, um, 
so I'm not sure if you were saying about their overall goals or just the, the home repair, but I'll just answer about the home repair for one second. Well, um, both, yeah. Okay, so on average, we do 14 small things per older adult. So, you, you know, you, when you hear, you might be thinking like a stair glide or a ramp or something, but it tends to be a lot of smaller things like a pull chain on a fan so that someone's not climbing up under their kitchen table or a sturdy step stool or a second banister or lowering their cabinets or sometimes a crock pot if someone doesn't have teeth. Um, and um, then in terms of the goals, goals, like what they're doing, um, the ADLs is always the most, like bathing. Bathing is kind of the biggest, um, bathing and walking well and, um, and dressing tend to be the biggest ones just no matter where. And, and what I sort of think of it is, is that instrumental activities of daily living, like getting food in the house or medications, people don't really mind other people doing it for me. Like I wouldn't mind if someone made me dinner every night, right? <laughs> um, but the ADLs, like getting bathed, pretty much no one wants that to be done for them. Um, and I think that that's, that's mostly just like human dignity kind of stuff. And so in general, the biggest ones are bathing and dressing that they want to do. And um, because it's so much tailored to each person, what we, what we do, it doesn't take very much adaptation like by culture or by region or because it's constantly being adapted in each instance of each person. Um, we are doing work right now to adapt it for people with dementia because all of the original work was with people who um, could make plans and remember things. And, um, and so we're adapting it now to work with people with dementia and their caregivers. Um, partnering with an agency like West Virginia Women Work would be great. Oh, nice. That's a really great idea. I had a question. I uh, heard you mention that the amount of money that has been saved is typically like 10 times the amount mm -hmm. of what you spend. And I was just curious how, if you had produced any um, documentation or products to be able to share that um, with some of these funding agencies and Absolutely. what what they look like and if they were Absolutely. Affected. I'm sorry, Ms. I was going to say sentence. if you had examples of what they looked like and if they, that was effective. Um, so, <laughs> yes and no. Um, so we do, and I'm happy to. Um, I mean, I could probably just screen share if I can think clearly, screen share and pull some up, or I could send you all. Um, but basically, the the thing with the cost savings is you, you're probably familiar with this, but I'll just go through it in case somebody's not on the call. There's something called the wrong pocket problem, which means like, let's say really good early child care saves in the prison system later. That's really important, but that doesn't mean that the early child care has more money. It doesn't mean like the prison is going to give money to the child care for there to be more child care. And so that's called the wrong pocket. It's like there's the pocket of the child care and the pocket of the prisons, and they're not in the same pocket, except for that they're both in the state budget. But, you know, the prison people will always feel underfunded and they're not going to say, well, I'm going to give money to the child care people, right? So the trick in growing something like this is either pulling the pockets together in, in some kind of partnership, you know, so for example, um, capable saves uh, nursing home admission. Well, if you're a Meals on Wheels, that doesn't mean you've got money from the nursing home admissions being less, right? So, but if you're Medicaid, on the other hand, it does. So if Medicaid, so like if West Virginia Medicaid wanted to pay for capable, they would save money on the hospitalizations and even more money on the nursing home admissions because Medicaid pays for nursing home admissions. So the trick is, um, you know, but like if I say to a hospital CEO, we can save hospitalizations, he or she will say, well, I still have to pay for the nurse. I still you know, I have to pay for this and that. The only thing you're saving me really is food until I can close a whole unit. Like until I can, there's, there's that many fewer people to pay for the, for a whole part of the building. Then it's only, you're saving Medicare money, but you're not actually literally saving the hospital money. You're saving you know, so the, the trick with all of this is thinking through who actually saves the money and trying to get them to pay the upfront costs. And so that's why we're trying to get Medicare to pay for Capable as a bundle so that you could, so a provider could write a prescription for Capable and then they could bill for it and people could get Capable, Medicare would be billed and Medicare would save money 
on the hospitalizations. Hmm. So that's interesting. Uh, there were two, based on what you were saying, um, Olmstead Council is, is nationwide, but for here, I'm thinking Olmstead Council, which avoids or, or transitions individuals out away from nursing home. Mm -hmm. And then the No Wrong Door, which is a CMS funded initiative. And I'm mm -hmm. just wondering if either of those at any state had incorporated the program to see if there were some effects. Right, so um, money follows the person is another part kind of of that. Kind of if someone's been in a nursing home, but they're kind of low need and they could go home. And so a couple of states are applying now for being able to do that with money follows the person's money. Um, and I know that Olmstead is like to keep people, have people in the lowest, um, you know, least restrictive area, but I don't know exactly how they work, the Olmstead councils. And largely, Ours, you know, they have, um, they focus on the AT needs, mm -hmm. assistive technology, so ramps and uh, modifications to the bathroom and things of that sort. But um, to my knowledge, I might be misspeaking. If someone else knows, please, please speak up, but less on the person centered and so the process. Yeah. Be one that would be really good. Um, same thing with the person centered element of no wrong door. Does this include the same kind of elements that you're mm -hmm. describing? Capable? Yeah, because at least in my knowledge, a lot of thing times when things are called person-centered, they're just making it more convenient for the person, but they're still kind of telling them what to do or giving them like a standard menu of things to do rather than really person-centered, like listening to the person and what that matters to them and then giving them these tools and abilities to do what matters. Interesting. But I may be, you may be a lot better in West Virginia than we are in, here in Maryland. And I do think that the disability and ability space leads in this area a lot in terms of listening to real people. It does, I know that the focus was on elderly adults. Um, as you were talking, I do think that um, some of our programs have home visiting components. Some, mm -hmm. um, and it, it would be interesting, some work with providers, some work with guardians. Mm -hmm. That relationship with the person in placement or the client um, yeah. might differ, might, might modify the, but I think capable is something that could easily be incorporated into those. Mm -hmm. And if you think about for the, the, um, things you were mentioning with, with the assistive technology, those things are usually a lot more expensive than what we're talking about. Um, and so sometimes that can make it easier to do a program like capable if, cause so for example, with Habitat for Humanity, they're used to spending $8,000 a house. So when we say, oh, it's just $3,000 a house, we say, they say, wow, you know, that seems doable. So there's also kind of the scale of what people are used to. I know that our, I don't see anyone um, from our AT. We do have an AT program here in the center and they have things like pay it forward. So mm -hmm. equipment that is recycled uh, and put to use okay. again and then loan. So um, that might help with the model of even yeah. just testing it out and they have assessments built in nice. that side of things. So that would be great. Any other questions? Well, I'll just say that I'm so impressed at how West Virginia has been doing on the vaccination rate for COVID. And um, seems like you guys are miles ahead of where the rest of the states are. So that's very cool. Well, thanks. We're we're proud of that. We'll accept that. There, we, we continue. Uh, I was just talking about with everyone a, a group that's really focused on individuals with uh, intellectual and developmental disorders mm -hmm. um, or disabilities, trying to get vaccines, particularly to them if they're not in the yeah. um, nursing home. Yeah. In the focus. So we're continuing to strive to to do more, but I appreciate we appreciate it. Um, oh, great question. Do you have issues with pushing with their agenda on what their loved ones need versus what the individual? Yes. <laughs> yes. So, um, so I'll give you an example. We had someone early on who had Parkinson's and her goal was to feed herself. 
her family had been feeding her because her tremor from Parkinson's was bad enough that, you know, she was getting food everywhere. And her, from, from her family perspective, where they were taking such good care of her, they felt like, no, I don't want to clamp the soup one more time. Like you can't feed yourself. And they were trying to say, that, no, that cannot be one of your goals. And um, she really very understandably wanted to feed herself. But luckily, uh, this was a conversation, you know, with the occupational therapist in the room. And um, there's weighted spoons that make it um, so that a tremor is much um, less likely to, um, to cause food to go out. So, so the occupational ther therapist said, this is their person's goal matters to them. Let's just try these, these things cost $7. Let's just try. And if they don't work, we can wash them and give them to somebody else, sterilize them, you know, and it was like transformative, these, these weighted, um, you know, spoons and fork and knife. And so the person could, and I think that um, family members, you know, like family members are humans, just like the rest of us. And they range from being amazing to being kind of neutral to being terrible and just like the rest of us. And, um, um, the trick is trying to have empathy, I think, for the family members, because sometimes they're dealing with so much, you know, we've had family members who require the person with a disability to just only stay in the basement because he was incontinent of urine and feces, and the family member was, you know, really tired of cleaning all that up, and it, it was really just trying to understand it from everyone's perspective, I think, is the best way, but we always try to have it that the person incapable is the person who's in charge in terms of the ultimate thing, but without shaming the family. We need to bring you back to walk us through how you train that, how you train uh -huh. to do that. I think that would be very valuable. Uh-huh. Probably our lead OT would be better than me, but I'd be, we'd, I'm sure we'd be happy to. Um, That'd be great. Yeah, she's amazing. And she has a, um, she once had a OT practice that was specifically for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and that's where her heart is. So I think she would love to do that. That's great. Um, well, thank you so much for the chance to meet you all and talk to you. And I hope that, um, you know, feel free to reach out if you have other questions or if you want to start, you know, there's no circle on the map for West Virginia for capable. So if anyone wants to rectify that. <laughs> Wonderful. Sounds good. There's many opportunities. And thanks for joining us and, and sharing a little bit more about it. My pleasure. Thank you guys so much. Take care. Okay. Bye-bye. Bye. Thanks. Bye. 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 Bye.